It's the Security Weekly News. Yes, it is. And it's episode 429. We're getting on up there in years. Um, I'm Doug White, and it's Friday the 8th of November. Uh, welcome to the show. We've got Robo Turing, Blue Noroff, Palo Alto, German Law, Fabric, Cisco, Banning Things, Aaron Leyland, and more on this edition of the Security Weekly News. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for the Security Weekly News. ThreatLocker implements a least privileged approach to cybersecurity, blocking every executable unless specifically authorized by your team. This methodology mitigates ransomware, supply chain attacks, zero-day exploits, and ensures 24-7, 365 and a quarter protection for your organization. To learn more about how ThreatLocker can help prevent known and unknown threats in your digital environment, safeguard your data and operations from threat actors, and align your organization with respected compliance frameworks, visit securityweekly.com slash ThreatLocker. All right, from the island of Elba, it's the Security Weekly News. I'm Doug White. Hit that like and subscribe button and leave a comment or the opposition party will take power. Yeah, that kind of thing. All right. So Mac OS users always used to be like, you know, they don't make viruses for Macs, man. Just Windows. Linux, the Linux users too, so don't you guys get all smug because Linux people are like, oh, well, I use Linux. I don't, you know... Okay, well, I always said, you know, I hadn't seen many pieces of malware that run an OS 400, so so there. But but none of these things are true because there's actually malware for just about anything. And if you can get a user to install it for you, I can probably write you something to attack MVS. But anyway, Blue Noroff, not so great name. Well, what does it even mean, Noroff? Is it like a logic switch? No. No, what is it? A, it's a Nor. I, I don't know. Any who cares? It's a North Korean based attacker that has been targeting crypto businesses with multi stage malware for wait for it. Is it QDOS, Sinex, AIX? No, it's Mac OS. Yeah, that's right. Smug people in coffee shops with your $5,000 laptops drinking your flat whites while the rest of us peasants have to settle for pouring hot water through an old sock filled with chicory and acorns. Yeah, and I'm not better. Chicory and acorns is pretty better, though. Oh, that was bad. Don't say stuff like that, Doug. Anyway, the new campaign is called Hidden Risk. Uh, kind of an obvious, like, I will rob you. And the lure is an email with fake news about some crypto sector tidbit. You know, like, read read more. You know, you, we all know those clickbait kind of things. Anyway, the malware apparently does not trigger any kind of, of an alert in the current Mac OS systems. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The payload is called Obj-C Shells, which opens a remote shell to that system. And the messages that come in have a link to a PDF that points to DelphiDigital.org. Uh, and, and, of course, that's the attacker-controlled domain. Now, a re and, of course, that can change. A recent document that they sent out was called Hidden Risk Behind New Surge of Bitcoin Price app. And... You know, I mean, just and, and they change that all the time. And apparently there's lots of different ones. And, and I think we all know this. But again, it's just sort of like, you know, ca cautionary tale. The first stage is a dropper app that is. And here's why it works. It's signed and notarized using a valid Apple dev ID called Avantis Reg Tech Private Limited. Now, Apple revoked this, of course, immediately. But I'm sure these guys plan for that because, you know, they probably have multiple ones of these. They probably rotate them. And, you know, this is just always one of these things that you've got to tell people to watch for. And, you know, I don't really know how to get them to stop clicking things like this because people click clickbait. That's the whole point. But anyway, if they do click it, the dropper downloads a decoy PDF from a Google Drive link and opens it on in, in your default PDF viewer. Um, I mean, I've always tried to block, you know, I mean, trying to allow list everything has always been my sort of strategy. And I know that's really difficult to do in large enterprise, but, you know, still blocking that Google Drive link might help. 
But in the background, while the PDF is being displayed going, you're going to be rich, I tell you. Uh, another stage, of course, is being downloaded from something called matuaner.org. Com, and all these are in the article if you're wanting to put them on your blocks. Um, the second stage uh, is called uh, is called X8664 Mach P. I'm sorry, the name of it is Growth, and, and it, it is an X8664 Mach P binary, and it only runs on Intel and Apple devices that have Rosetta emulation framework uh, enabled. So that one modifies a config file called .zshenev, uh, Zush and uh, it's Zush in env is what it is Z S H E N V so it's the Z S H environment which is hidden in the user's home directory so they have this file but it's got a dot in front of it so it doesn't show up in Linux based system and it loads during a, a Z S H session and if you want all the details the article goes through every last step of this and you know but but don't kid yourself. It's, you know, and, and don't let your people kid themselves. Someone somewhere is writing malware for your Solaris workstation. I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I can't resist telling this. I, I, we had a punch card. We had an, an actual punch card that could change your print job header on your print job so that when you sent your work to be printed, which was how everybody did things back then, it printed cheater on instead of your username because it printed your username in big block letters so that it printed cheater and then uh, you could just slip it into people's card decks and they didn't know why it was happening because you know they couldn't read code since they were cheating and yeah and then they're like coming up to the window going hi hello sign up for computer science 16 10 and it printed cheater on my code for some reason and you're like did you copy your code oh uh, when you say copy, yeah, you know, you know what I mean. Anyway, I'll shut up about that. CISA in the United States uh, issued a warning that attackers are exploiting actively a missing auth vulnerability in Palo Alto Networks Expedition. Uh, Expedition is a tool that allows you to convert firewall configs from other uh, devices like checkpoints and Cisco and so forth to the Pan OS, which is Palo Alto's. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I almost called it iOS. Um, the flaw was actually patched back in July. And basically, this is a flaw that can allow attackers to remotely exploit it to reset application admin credentials. Ooh. Now, this only works, of course, if your expedition server is exposed to the internet. Is your expedition server exposed to the internet? Please hit your hand with this hammer right now. The searing pain and permanent injury that will result will help to remind you to put all this stuff on private VLANs and access it with a locked up VPN instead of just saying, I sure do like opening ports of the internet. Here I go opening ports of the internet again. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm trying to do a Crumbopulous, Michael, but I don't think it worked. Um, anyway, a proof of concept for the exploit was released in October, but CISA did not release any additional information about the attack specifically. Uh, basically, federal agencies, if you are subject to CISA, and even if you're not, come on, uh, you need to secure vulnerable devices within three weeks, which is the 28th of November. Everyone else, secure them today. I mean, yeah, or to, maybe tomorrow, but today would be better. Or just put them on a private VLAN. Really? A draft of a law in Germany was introduced this week that would protect researchers from criminal prosecution under the computer crimes law when they discover security vulnerabilities. Wow, that might be nice. Um, I mean, I think we need that in the U.S. too, right? I mean, I mean, currently the law, the federal law anyway, says that, you know, we could be prosecuted for doing a pen test, technically. Uh, the criminal code in Germany is covered what is is covering what is called data espionage that and it says, quote, anyone who without authorization gains access for themselves or another to data that is not intended for them and is specifically protected against unauthorized access by overcoming access security shall receive a penalty of up to three years in prison or a fine. It sounds better in the original German. Um the change that they're adding says that basically it's okay if, if this is carried out with the intent to identify a vulnerability or other security risk in an information technology system and responsibly reported or, and, and they responsibly report the flaw to an appropriate authority. 
So I think that's a pretty good change. And, you know, it would encourage people to actually report this kind of stuff to CISA or to other to, you know, to, uh, I don't know, so whoever the appropriate authority is. So it's kind of a nice add on that might encourage people to actually, you know, share. Remember the coal fire labs case? I mean, this was a pretty complicated thing. And there were, pen, there were two pen testers that were hired to check out a courthouse in Iowa. And they were doing some physical pen test stuff and they had lock picks and things. But I used to do physical pen tests. I had lock picks. I had wrecking bars. I had all kinds of stuff. And basically, they were hired legally by the state of Iowa's state court administration to check these buildings out. And then guess what? Some deputy sheriffs showed up. A local sheriff and the deputy sheriffs apparently were just sort of enjoying the demonstration of them picking locks. But then the local sheriff, who had some kind of political uh, beef with somebody at the state, came and tossed them in jail. They were charged with crimes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the crime, I mean, these charges just recently got, uh, I think, removed on these people. Now, I mean, you know, and I mean, and so a turf war is probably always going to be a turf war. But technically, you could face federal charges for scanning a web server you don't own or have custodianship of in the United States. And the German saw, law sounds awfully familiar. So maybe talk to your reps about this. Uh, people always, you know, you tell people to do that and they're always like, oh, really? But years ago, I, you know, I got concerned about this thing that was going on. And I actually talked to my state senator who just happened to live across the street from me. And, uh, and I was talking to him about a state law and he actually worked with me to get it changed. I couldn't get him to change the thing on, on uh, Cuban cigars and wine, but, you know, he said some things I cannot do. But we got this law changed in cybersecurity, and I did have to go to a couple of meetings at the State House in Rhode Island, and, and it's not air-conditioned, and it was pretty hot, and I had to fight off the private investigator lobby uh, at the same time, but we got it passed. So, you know, you can instigate change if you just, you know, work at it. A lot of you have better connections than I do. Fabrice, Fabrici, I think it means artisan in Latin. Uh, I have a Latin consultant that I know, and I, he, I always ask him Latin questions, but I, I couldn't reach him today. So I don't even know how to say it, but, uh, and I'm not even sure it's supposed to be Latin, and it is a name. But uh, anyway, a malicious Python package called Fabrici or Fabrice, or however you want to say it, has been live on PyPy since 2021. And essentially, they call this a typo squatting attack because Fabrice and Fabric are just have that E on the end. So Fabrice has an E on the end of it. Fabric does not. And it is basically typo squatting on the Fabric SSH automation library, which you've probably used. Uh, this thing has been downloaded 37,000 times, which is not that many, but it's enough. And, you know, the Fabric library has been downloaded 201 million times. And, of course, Fabric is a totally legitimate uh, library. And I, I've used, I mean, it lets you run commands remotely over SSH uh, so that you can do things and, and not just run them, but you return objects to Python. So if you need to run a system query, uh, you can, you know, write a Python script on your control system, have uh, Fabric SSH over to a server somewhere and pull down, you know, information and so forth. That is like a Python object. Very, very handy thing. But the other one, it basically exfiltrates your AWS credentials. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, getting a dev's credentials or the AWS logins for the lo for the cloud production environment is probably going to be pretty nasty. So, one... Ensure you don't have this thing anywhere. You know, you may just want to search for it and make sure you don't have any dev or send out a note and say, hey, you're not using this, are you? Uh, remind, so 37,000 people are. So some somewhere out there, some of you have this. Uh, remind your devs about typo squatting in repositories where, you know, which, I mean, that sounds like something nasty, doesn't it? Like, where's Dan? Out back typo squatting in the repository. Or, or yeah, that could be that could mean all kinds of things. But and, and also think about how to manage libraries and APIs, because I think we need to do more of that to ensure that this doesn't happen to you from this or from something else. Has someone typo squatted in your repository? You may be entitled to compensation. Call Magellan, Viducci and Pomerantz, the big stick team. We will get your money. Are DUIs preventing you from getting your school bus license? We can help. I, so I stole that last one from John Mulaney. Thanks for making fun of Providence, John, although it was really funny. Um, 
We haven't talked about Cisco in a while. Cisco issued a critical alert notice about a flaw in the ultra. You got a, you got a, you got a lot of hubris, hubris when you name your product the ultra reliable wireless backhaul system. Uh, well, there's a flaw in it, uh, and it's apparently quite easy to subvert. The exploit was made public on Wednesday, and it, it is in the unified industrial wireless software that the device is in the ultra reliable wireless backhaul system use. Wow, that was a lot of syllables. Basically, a remote attacker with no privileges could upgrade themselves to admin level access and install files. Yeah, that's going to sting. I think, you know, we've had two of these this week. I think I'm going to start calling a remote attacker with no privileges a drifter. Remember when people worried about drifters a lot? And we kept getting warned about that. Like, hey, kids, if you're on your yard, you know, and, and you see a drifter. Really, I mean, they had like whole thing pamphlets and all that stuff. I, although maybe it was code for that b- basketball coach. Anyway, I'm not going there. Who am I, Anthony Jeselnik? Yeah, okay. Any, anyway, multiple catalyst access points are affected by this. They have a list in the article, and you can, or you can run in iOS. You can run MPLS config to see if it's been enabled. Uh, the flaw is scored 10 out of 10 on CVSS since it's easy, effective, and can be done by a drifter. Not a pedophile basketball coach, but the other kind of drifter. Oh, well, not that drifter, but the, you know the one I'm talking about. Uh, anyway, the remote no-privilege attacker, yeah, I'm going to call that a drifter. All right. After only what seems like about 25 years, Google will enforce mandatory multi-factor authentication for all Google Cloud users by tomorrow? January? No, wait for it, literally. By the end of 2025. (laughs) This will only apply, of course, for users who are using the cloud, not all users in general. Uh, And only then users who currently use passwords for authentication or any new users. It won't actually apply to general consumer accounts, so don't panic. Um, This month, they will be notifying cloud admins about the transition and how to prepare. Uh, well, it's a start anyway. It's better than, than not doing it. But look, you should be using multi-factor already. You should require multi-factor, and it will at least help you somewhat with phishing and malware, please. CISA says multi-factor is one of the key recommendations in the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency Secure by Design initiative. Amazon started requiring mandatory MFA back in June for AWS administrators. Snowflake in July made it an option, an option, of course, to make it mandatory for all users. And Microsoft is rolling it out on Azure starting last month. You need this even at home. But before you get carried away at home and in the enterprise, uh, think about rollback plans and so forth. Because I did have a guy who tied his bank account into a YubiKey and then, you know, good move, smart. But then he lost a YubiKey and he had some issues of how to get back into. Yeah. So always think about that. So read up on this, even in your enterprise. What's the recovery going to be like when somebody loses their key? Protect your access with MFA and then protect all your assets always. Uh, banning kids from things. <laughs> I got to admit, banning books got me to read banned books. Uh, a whole bunch of them. I mean, if they, they told me it was banned, I, I knew this person that had banned books in a filing cabinet and they would be like, oh yeah, you can read, you can read this Hermann Hess novel. And you know, those movies that were listed in ba- banned in 136 countries. Well, that got me to watch flesh eating zombies, which I kind of regretted, but I did probably eat a plate of spaghetti while I was watching it. Oh, and Pier Paolo Pasolini movies. Yeah. <laughs> you probably don't want to watch those. Anyway, I just always find banning things makes them more appealing to a lot of people. You know, what, what's in those magazines wrapped in plain brown paper on the top back shelf of the bodega? I'm going to find out. Come on, Jimmy. We're going down here. I mean, well, anyway, Australia has pledged now to legislate a limit of 16 years for social media access. And they did put some teeth in it. And they have penalties for online platforms that don't comply. Mm hmm. It is Australia, so the, are the teeth venomous? Probably. Of course, how does this work? They don't really explain how Facebook or TikTok could actually enforce this age limit. Ever, have you ever bought Mickey's Big Mouth? What, what, what is in Mickey's Big Mouth anyway? Beer, a, ale, alien gland squeezings? I, I'm not sure, but you, you know, when you borrowed your friend's older brother's driver's license to prove you were 18 because you kind of look like him, sort of. Yeah, it was a long time ago. The government said they would not rule out having the faces of users subject to biometric scanning. Yeah, scanning kids' faces, that will end well. (laughs) Yeah, 
Way that you go to parents in Australia and go, yeah, we're going to be scanning your kids' faces and putting them in a database. It's uh, Don't worry about it. It's being run by these guys over here. You can trust them? Absolutely. I'm not going to say what I was thinking. But they also said maybe all users' ages would have to be verified with a new government database for all social media users and require the tech companies to set that up. We're going to build that and they're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that always goes over so well. And wait till you tell everybody using social media, they got to have their face scanned into a government database. Yeah, that'll be popular. The roadmap said that some sort of double uh, double blind tokenized approach would be used so that a third party provider would transfer information between sites and age assurance providers, but also called that market immature but developing. Oh, yeah, th this is yeah. This is this is <laughs> this isn't going to work, folks. Kind of like the expensive net nanny sense system they set up at the cloud uh, cloud bluff high school. I was asked to review. I, I changed the name. Uh, it worked pretty well at keeping the teachers off the gambling and porn sites, but the students got around it pretty fast and then helped the teachers get around it too. Now, good luck with the with this old people writing this law. I also read all those comics you said would turn me into a perverted drug addled sex fiend, and so yeah, that that did happen. But but you you get the idea. Well, after a restful week of fighting communism and email phishing lures, it is the much-awaited return of the one and only Aaron Leyland. Hi, Aaron. I can't believe they replaced me with a Southern Irish guy last week. What's going on? <laughs> We're trying to start, you know, like some kind of troubles. Was he like, dirty, dirty, dirty. It's like 33 in a herd. It's like, what you doing there, me friends? I'm sure he. No, I listened. He was a great guy. He was really smart. He is great. Yeah, I, I, I like him. Yeah, Rob's, Rob's really. I mean, he's really good. He, he has a lot to say, even even if he's got the wrong accent for our show. But right, you know, we'll, we'll just, and he's we'll much just, smarter than me, probably. But it's a, it's fun. Well, yeah, we'll have we're gonna have a test one day. I'm gonna get you both on, and we'll we'll, right? we'll do some. Yeah, what we'll the, ask you. We'll do ask do you do questions. Do 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 do. We'll do a Security Ooh. Weekly game show. Right, let's do that. <laughs> Okay, right. So I, I'm going to tell you stuff that's not as smart as Rob, but let's go. Stick where we. Let's go, guys. Um, so today's article: What you need to know about Tor browser and anonymity. So, good start, right? So the article from Kaspersky, another good start. Don't we just love Kaspersky? They're like our friends. You like kick them out of your country and stuff. Um, discusses the Tor browser and its role in online anonymity. So key points: as we all know, the Tor, the Onion Router the Tor browser, anonymizes, there's so, so many words that I can't say, uh, user traffic through a distributed network of servers called nodes. Each packet is encrypted multiple times as it passes through these nodes, making it difficult to trace the origin and destination. That's what you think. So, although there are de-anonymization risks, <laughs> so anyway, Despite its robust encryption, Tor is not foolproof. Techniques like timing analysis can be used to de-anonymize users. This involves monitoring Tor exit nodes and correlating data packet timings with ISP data. So between you and me and the whole world, it's believed that the majority of the exit nodes are owned by government, making this easier. Also, you may know that the U.S. Navy invented it in the 1990s to pass messages with their human intelligence spies. It's like spy stuff. It's so cool. Um, the article highlights, right, there, it, if you go into the article, in the show notes, it's obvious, always, um, a recent case where the German intelligence service de-anonymized a Tor user involved in criminal activities using time analysis um, and in the article, they say it was possible due to the high number of Tor exit nodes in Germany. Yeah, owned by the government. Anyway, um, so there's a response from the Tor project because we always want both sides, right? The Tor project maintains that their browser is still safe, emphasizing that the de-anonymized individual was using an outdated version of Tor and the Ricochet messaging app. They also mentioned Vanguard add-on, but um, let's talk about that in a minute. Um, right. There's user recommendations, but then I'm going to give you some more. Of course I am. So the article provides several tips for maintaining anonymity while using Tor, such as avoiding logging into personal accounts, not torrenting over Tor, and using HTTPS versions of the website. Crazy that. <laughs> HTTPS. Crazy. 
And so anyway, from a cybersecurity perspective, this article underscores the importance of understanding both the strengths and limitations of a non-anonymity tools like Tor. Why Tor provides significant, more than normal, privacy benefits. It's not invulnerable to sophisticated de-anonymization techniques. Um, this highlights the need for continuous vigilance and updates to both the software and user practices. The case study of the German intelligence operation serves as a reminder that no tool can guarantee complete anonymity, especially against well-resourced adversaries, governments. Um, it also emphasizes the importance of using the latest versions, I'll say this so many times, of privacy tools and being aware of potential vulnerabilities. Okay, to achieve a high level of anonymity on the internet, especially when using Tor, you need to combine um, advanced tools and techniques. And I'm going to give you a breakdown. Okay, so this made me laugh when I wrote it. Use the Tor browser correctly. Learn how to use it. That made me laugh. But yeah, use it correctly because they didn't, right? Um, as we know, Tor and then Vices, I'm getting worse at saying it, your traffic by routing it through multiple nodes, which are also called relays. Each relay only knows the previous and next hop, not the entire path, which helps obscure your identity. Um, what you must do is adjust the security settings, Google all this, um, in Tor browser to the highest level to block JavaScript and other potentially identifying scripts. This, this is a must. Avoid personal accounts. Do not log into personal accounts or use services that can link your activity back to your real identity. Also, VPN, guys. So combine Tor with VPN. You can do this on both sides. So VPN before Tor, which is more common, use a VPN to hide your IP address from your ISP before connecting to the Tor network. And this adds a extra layer of anonymity um, by preventing, hopefully, your ISP from knowing you're using Tor. And then VPN after Tor, Google Ads, pretty cool. Um, right, use a secure operating system, something like Tails OS, um, which, as most of you all know, is a live operating system that you can book from a USB stick, and that will route all internet traffic through Tor, and apparently, according to them, leaves no trace on... Well, after it's shut down, it's gone, right? So it's gone, gone. Um, so also you have... I don't know how you pronounce this in America, but Hunix, which is a security-focused operating system. Um, it's like Linux, but Hunix, who is it? Um, that runs inside a virtual machine. It uses Tor to anonymize all internet traffic and isolates applications to prevent leaks. Harden your system. Disable web RTC, right? There's talk on the internet about um, disabling that because it can lead to leaks. And as I said before, <laughs> use HTTPS everywhere. It's like, why would you not? It's like, well, uh, difficult with Tor, isn't it? Okay, this is cool. Spoof your MAC address. You should be mostly doing this anyway, right? Reg if, if you can get away with it, regularly change your MAC address to prevent tracking on your hardware. Now some really good spy stuff to practice good OPSEC, which we know is operational security. Separate identities. Use different identities for different activities. Never mix personal and anonymous activities. I told you, right? Avoid metadata leaks. Be cautious about the metadata you generate, such as timestamps, file sizes, and formats. Use tools like MAT2, which is a metadata anonymization toolkit to strip metadata from files. Use encrypted communication for message. Use Signal or something like that. That's pretty cool, right? And some more super speaky, super speaky, super speaky, speaky, scat spy geeky stuff. Virtual machines, run your activities inside virtual machines to isolate them from your host. This can prevent malware from affecting your main system. And if you want to be super, super geeky, um, use AirGap systems. So for the highest security, use an AirGap computer. That's one that's never been connected to the internet for sensitive tasks. Transferring data using encrypted USB drives. That's just fun, isn't it? <laughs> or don't connect to the internet ever if you want to be secure. Throw all your tech in the bin. Throw it in the sea. Get a shark to eat it. Okay, this one's basic and a bit advanced vigilance. Keep software updated. But also there's ways to monitor for leaks, so Google that. So anyway, in conclusion, so by combining these techniques, you can significantly enhance your online anonymity. 
However, remember that no method is foolproof and staying anonymous requires continuous vigilance and adaption to new threats. So this, this is why terrorists still pass paper messages. But as we know, where there's a way, there's a way to break the controls of the way. We've all seen the movie of how they find Osama bin Laden, right? Okay, back to our new and cheaper clone, Dr. Doug, who works harder for praise, apparently just like your favorite LLM. That's me. Can't beat that. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, you know, I I would add to that. Uh, always have a sandbox available, uh, you know, on your systems because and don't trust it. But it's nice to have a sandbox so that when you do see something suspicious or a site that you're not sure about, try it there first before you do anything else because it could be bad. And if you get those files, you really want to open because I do get stuff that's legitimate and I don't want to open it because it's a constant barrage of stuff that's not legitimate. And students send me things and they don't follow instructions. And here, you know, and, and, and you know, and I'm like, do I open this file? And I, you know, I, it, it's worrisome. So thanks. Great advice from Aaron. Uh, see you uh, later. Well, I have some oil paintings. Um, really. And one of them was exhibited at the uh, Venice uh, Biennale in the 1930s. And I mean, it's it's like it's still a famous art show, but it was it was famous then. And suppose reputedly, according to the letter that was in the in the frame, it, it says that the, the painting was reviewed by Benito Mussolini, the famous dictator. But uh, anyway, I asked this art appraiser what it was worth. And, you know, and he said, well, Art is worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it, <laughs> which I said, so not much. Um, now, a robot artist named Ida Robot painted a picture of Alan Turing, one of my personal heroes. You've heard me say that before. And it was apparently up for sale at Sotheby's. Now, I was curious and I found out that it was expected to sell for $120,000. Okay. So now, unless one of you wants to hire me as a really expensive consultant, uh, you know, then probably not this year. But it sold for $1 million with an M after 27 bids. So what is it worth? A million dollars. Sothby said this was the first sale of an artwork by a robot artist. I don't agree with that because I bought a robot made painting about five years ago that's hanging upstairs in my house for like, you know, 50 bucks. But Maybe it's the, I mean, I mean, I don't know. So anyway, art's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay. So before people get all critical about art, I mean, if somebody will pay $120,000 for a banana taped to a wall, well, so what? Go for it. More power to them. You know, I mean, if I could, if I'd known I could tape bananas to the wall and get $120,000, I would have done it too. But I didn't think of it. Somebody else did. So also, if any of you want to send me $120,000, that, that's fine. I'll be happy to accept it as a donation. So, yeah. Just keep that in mind. If you're out there wondering what to do with that $120,000 you got laying around. Anyway, that's the news. Thank you, Aaron. And we will see you next time on the Security Weekly News.